Ladies and gentlemen, um, let's settle down so that we can start um, session three. Um, thank you very much for joining our session. Uh, my name is Susie Wayne Mabe. I'm going to be sharing this session. Um, so we're really um, excited um, to have this session today. I'm sure um, you, from the previous speaker, I think this is sort of a build-up to show that you know, what a better way to celebrate the AEN SHL 11 years this year sort of um, unpack and understand why relationships are important. And I think also, before we begin uh, this uh, session, I just want to highlight a few things. Um, evidence and evaluation um, in Africa need to have a gender and equity lens, because that is really important. And also, we have a few uh, female leaders um, that are going to be speaking to us uh, during this session. This is the all-female um, panel of amazing individuals experience and in the idea. And also, um, women's voices often are go unheard or under, you know, valued in terms of the opinions that they, they share. And now this panel is because they are established and have experience. And so I hope you are looking forward to the discussions that we are going to have with them this afternoon. Okay, sorry, there's a malfunction with this one. <laughs> I'll say take it off so that it doesn't disturb my, my group. Okay, um, for this session, uh, because it's a celebration for the Africa Evidence Network and why relationships matter, we are going to take this opportunity um, to share an eight minutes video with you of the journey of the AEN. So enjoy um, this video before we delve into the discussions that brought us together with this panel. Are we struggling to get the video? Okay. Um, we'll look at the video um, later on um, as you find the video, because the eight minutes video that is celebrating the journey of the Africa Evidence Network. Without wasting any time, um, I would like to, I'm not going to use the traditional way of doing things, reading my panelists' bio. So I would like them to introduce themselves and share one short story that illustrates why relationships matter to them. So that's really uh, important to hear um, their stories just in the beginning of this discussion. So I think I'll start from this side to allow Rona to settle down, uh, <laughs> not to uh, ask her to, to share first. Um, Ruth? Thank you very much, Siswe, and congratulations to Rona. <laughs> Take a breath. I'm sharing the stage with some of my heroes today, and it's such a privilege. My name's Ruth Stewart. Um, I had the good luck of being at the very first gathering of the Africa Evidence Network 11 years ago. And I wanted to tell you a story about climbing trees. Did anyone else climb trees when they were children? Oh, yeah. People are nodding here. I had a favorite mango tree and a favorite branch at the top 
and none of my siblings or friends were allowed on that branch. And I thought I was very clever because I could climb to the highest branch and nobody else could get higher than me. But I realized after a while that climbing to the highest branch on the tree was a bit lonely. <laughs> and my sisters and all the other neighborhood friends would have cookies and sweets and juice at the bottom of the tree. And I would try and persuade them to throw me a snack, but I wasn't willing to give up my branch at the top of the tree. And I would go to bed sulking. <laughs> and fast forward 20 years, and I started to slip into that same error in the early stages of my career. I thought I was really clever. I had a degree from a really fancy university, and I thought I knew everything. I could climb to the top of my tree and be brilliant. But can I tell you, it's really lonely at the top of the tree. <laughs> and fortunately, lots of wise people around me pointed out that I was missing out on the cookies, I wasn't making friends, and I wasn't achieving anything apart from being at the top of the tree on my favorite branch. And I learned the hard way that we, we need to come down from our trees and make friends with one another. We need to professionally build partnerships and learn together. And it, success is no longer, in my mind, being at the top. It's, in fact, it's, it's, it's about being at the bottom of the tree and learning to learn from one another and share. So that's my little story about why relationships matter to me and something about my favorite childhood activity in the mango tree. So thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, uh, Ruth, uh, for that story. Maybe we can go to you, um, Rosetti. Uh, thank you very much. Hello. Uh, Rosetti Nabumba Nayenga is my name, and I am serving as the president of the African Evaluation Association. In March 2024, I invite you to Rwanda, Chigali, for the 11th Africa Conference, and I'll vacate this seat and I would love to have someone who is strong enough to come and sit in the seat and take a prayer forward. I, I work in the Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development in this country. Thank you very much, Ruth. That was interesting, that tree. Uh, I would like to talk about relationships in a different way, that our relationships will work if they are nurtured over a longer period. Usually, uh, short-term relationships don't deliver the objectives we need. And unfortunately, in Africa, there are few people who actually come to have long-term relationships with us. Mm -hmm. So we have to work very hard to nurture relationships. And uh, before we go to look for partners outside, I think relationships starts building starts internally. If you are not at peace in an organization, you cannot deliver. So where I'm sitting in Afria, if my board is not working and my secretariat is not working, if the relationship is not good, you cannot actually convince anyone else to partner with you from the outside. So it starts with that and it requires that as we start on the journey of uh, partnership, we must have strong commitment of the leaders that choose to actually uh, be part of the organizations. I want to also mention that, uh, and, and, and bring my short story, uh, that um, these relationships require core values of trust, respect for one another, stewardship, good stewardship of resources, and acceptance of uh, rewards and liabilities. And I'll give you an example. Uh, in in Afria, uh, in 2017, Adeline, and I'm glad she was here, was the president then. And she brokered uh, this relationship with the uh, United States Department of State, the, uh, the Bureau of Democracy. And we got this project, which was about $500,000. And we are supposed to uh, deliver research made in Africa in five countries. I took that on 
and we were only able to do two because the packaging was not right uh, of this project. And, uh, but the USDS recognized the importance of uh, um, our relations and said, please use the money to do what you actually want to do. So because of trust and respect, we have done other things. And now we have pro brokered a second relationship with the American Evaluation Association. So thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, um, Rosetti, uh, for giving us that uh, bit of background and your story. Um, Marie, your story. Thank you, and just checking, is this on? Do you hear me fine? Yes, okay, excellent. Um, so let me start by saying um, what an honor it is to be on this panel with such amazing leaders in the evidence to policy space. And I'd say it's not a coincidence. Uh, it is because I know, and 3IE knows several of the panelists from before, and that we're part of a network that can be traced back 15 years mm. to people, to events. Um, so thank you uh, for inviting me. Um, I'd also like to reflect and take a moment uh, to reflect on what the COVID experience mm. meant for relationships and partnerships. Um, and, you know, while the urgency of the situation led to some swift formation of new partnerships, evidence alliances and the like, I think many of us felt that it became harder to expand our networks, maybe also even to retain the networks uh, that we had. Um, and, so, and for many of you, uh, I think there are quite a few young fa new faces uh, in the room, uh, and you may have started your professional lives during this time. Um, and you must have felt this issue the most acutely. And so I'm really hoping that you'll take this moment, uh, being many of us in person and missing some of you online, but uh, really to sort of help, um, you know, and build those networks. They're so important. Um, so I didn't say who I was. My name is Marie Garder. Uh, I'm the executive director for 3IE and also uh, co-chair for the International Development Coordinating Group of the Campbell collaboration. Um, but right now, and we'll talk more about that later, right now I just want to say more like who am I as a person. And I would say two things. I'm an introvert and an impatient, impatient woman. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I have a passion. I have a passion for improving evidence use in development. Um, and I have had to learn, and I'm continuing to learn lessons, some of it very much the hard way, about relationships in order actually to be able to fulfill my and my organization's uh, you know, uh, mission. Um, and so let me mention just three <coughs> lessons or sort of insights I have uh, come to. Uh, and please do laugh at all of them. Uh, I, I've been very, very ignorant. Um, so I sincerely thought for the longest time that evidence speaks for itself and that who delivers it should not matter. Um, and you will have, we've had a nice session already talking about how that is terribly wrong, probably. Um, and, you know, I thought that when people got to hear this clear evidence of, and they would just know what to do, they would run with it and they would, you know, we would all be uh, uh, trying to improve the world with this evidence. Um, now, how wrong could I be, right? Yeah. And of course, the extent to which this information has taken a hold in societies through social media should be, a, of course, a wake-up call. Um, so the reality is this. The messenger matters, the delivery matters, relationships matter, and of course, incentives matter. And so in order to increase your chance of contributing uh, to change, you, know, you basically need to, to use all those and pull all those levers uh, through partnerships. The other thing I thought when I was younger is that being right was important and also letting others know I was right. Uh, again, I've learned my lesson and I didn't find an African proverb, but I found another uh, nice saying. Um, that goes like this. Immature people always want to win an argument, even at the cost of a relationship. And mature people understand that it's always better to lose an argument and win a relationship. And finally, 
I also thought, naively, that asking for ad advice was a sign of weakness. Mm. And in fact, uh, and there's now ample scientific evidence to show this, people get happy when they get to give, not when they take. Um, and so some of the best relationships uh, I built during the years are those where I have asked for favors, where I've asked for advice, asked for inputs. Um, and it's also some of the best advice and inputs I have gotten. Um, and in fact, a manager colleague of mine uh, at the World Bank at some point actually summed it up in one sentence. Just remember, Marie, everyone wants to be needed and loved. Yeah. And it's amazing uh, advice that I've taken with me. So to sum this up, uh, the lessons that I've learned is, is really the importance of investing in relationships, both as important in order to be happy and, and function as a human, but also in order to actually achieve what we all are trying to achieve together. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Um, let's go over to Rona to share her story um, about why relationships matter and introduce herself again. But I think um, everyone uh, knows her already, but just to reintroduce yourself again. Um, I don't think this is working. No. Can you hear me now? I'll just use that for a bit as I get sorted. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Rona Mijumbi. I wear so many hats. Uh, but I think what is really relevant for today, uh, I am the founding director at the Center for Rapid Evidence Synthesis, which we mentioned earlier as your local host, and make use of them. Uh, they are dressed a certain way you see them. Make use of them. Um, I also work with the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine and uh, with their affiliate the Malawi Liverpool Welcome Program in Blantyre, Malawi, heading the policy unit. And I was also very, very um, privileged uh, to take over from Ruth, working alongside um, Siziwe as the co-chair, uh, as the current co-chair of the AEN. But my journey has been long, uh, you know, with evidence, and it's a journey that I'm very proud of. Uh, lots of stories, and I think all my stories are really wrapped around relationships. Um, having started off almost uh, as a one man's army, you know, uh, with the work that I was doing uh, around rapid evidence synthesis and things like that. But over the 10 or 13 years now, uh, it's really been relationships. And I wish I could talk about each one of them. I have a relationship with people on this stage. But the one thing that I can say, um, it sounds good when we talk about relationships, and I think we should all be garnering for that. Uh, but a, as a person, um, so I am an extroverted introvert. <laughs> yeah? Um, I hope you've bumped into those uh, definitions of them. I really, I am an introvert. Like, it's okay for me to spend four days just chilling out on my own, doing nothing, you know? But then I'm okay with company, you know? But the thing with extroverted introverts is that you get tired at some point. You, not really tired, you run out of the steam, you know, that, 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 that takes you through that time and you need to recharge. You're not like the extrovert who can go non-stop, okay? So you run out of steam. Now, the most important thing for a person like that is to know when you are out of steam and to know what really takes the steam out of you. Now, that's the same thing for relationships beyond the personal relationship. Even when we make relationships in this evidence world, I think at the end of the day, we have to realize that we are, or should be, extroverted introverts. I don't think that you can go non-stop. You need the time to go back and reflect as an organization, as a single person leading an organization, you need that time to step back and see what it is that's happening with this relationship, what you need to do with it, what needs, you know, sort of resetting, you do need that. And if you don't, 
you're bound to run out of steam or they are bound to run out of steam for you, okay? Because what happens with relationships is that it starts with you. You've got to know who you are to be able to offer. And that also means that not every relationship will be right for you, okay? In this space, and especially in our setting, we get a lot of invites to relationships. And because we have a lot of need, especially resource need, it's always looking exciting. Oh, we shall learn this, we shall get monies for this, we shall get the capacity for this, we'll be able to do this. And so we, we tend to jump in, you know, at every invite. And then somewhere along the way, you begin to get uncomfortable, but you're not too sure how to get out of it. And then, you know, it's going, it's not going, you know, you're giving more than you plan to. You're not even sure what you're giving. Okay, so it starts with you. You've got to know who you are and what you can offer. And so you will know when a relationship comes and mm, maybe it's not for you. Okay, and that takes me to the next point. And all of this I have learned um, more in my adult life, and a lot of it I wish I knew earlier, okay? So it takes me to, to my next point of, it's so important to be genuine in your relationships. They don't have to be just the personal relationships. We try so hard in our personal relationships, but when it comes to work, we sort of, you know, we, we create some sort of profile and see how it will go. It, it, it doesn't matter so much to us the whole genuine thing. But I will tell you that it's so important to be genuine in these relationships. Let the people who work with you be sure that when I'm dealing with Ruth, I know what I'm getting. What I see is what I get. It's so important. Learn how to also say no. Okay, it's a difficult one. And I think, you know, um, one of my, actually my very first boss when I was doing, you know, evidence to policy work, has even published, I think, two publications about how to say no, you know? Um, we tend to want to give, to want to be good, to want to, you know? And it becomes a bit difficult to say no when you want to say no. And then you stretch yourself out too thin, you say yes to everything, and then you can't deliver. And then the question is, was she as good as she said she was, you know? And it's not actually about you not being good, but you just can't give everything. So I think mine is more of caution, yeah? Um, and also to say, you've got to be in the right place before you get into a relationship. And that right place means knowing yourself and being ready um, with what you can offer and also knowing what you can't offer. I think I'll stop there for now. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Rona. And I think you've seen that they've started somewhere climbing trees, yeah. not knowing that it's cold up there by yourself, <laughs> um, trying to be liked yeah. as young people, yeah. trying to accept all relationships yeah. that are available. Um, so I think those are some of the lessons that they've learned and they've come to this point now. And I think our second question um, will delve into it a bit more to say, you know, each of them can share how the AEN and or your organization's commitment to relationship build building has changed the, the landscape of evidence use in Africa or in the continent. And also please feel free to sort of interact with each other's responses and enrich the discussions even more or challenge um, each other in this uh, discussion. So I think uh, for this question, I would like to start with you, uh, Marie, uh, to share your <laughs> insights on this one. Okay, thank you. Um, so. PIE as an organization has always been what I would call a connector or a network weaver. I was thinking of spider, but that sounds negative, so I'm not going <laughs> to go there. Um, in the early days when we were, you know, we were more of a grants management organization, uh, especially in the impact evaluation space. And what we would do then was be to connect grantees with funders, policymakers with researchers, um, funders with funders. Um, in fact, one of our earliest policy windows uh, in which we connected important government programs that needed evaluation with researchers and evaluators was here in Uganda um, in collaboration with the, the office of the Prime Minister. Um, 
15 years on, so this was 15 years ago, 50 years on, we continue to be a connector uh, and we benefit from those 15 years of uh, having created and learned from and built networks. However, the landscape has uh, changed uh, and so has 3IE's approach. Um, so we now have a much more what you call a holistic approach mm -hmm. in which we work with governments and development institutions very much as a, as a long-term partner to help them meet their evidence needs and to support them on their journeys to institutionalize evidence use in their institutions. Um, and we do so explicitly through partnerships in all our programs. And we are very clear now about the fact that we do not have all the required skill sets in all the approaches that may be required. required. We also do not have the right networks the right uh, contextualized understanding, uh, and that we can and have to and should draw upon all our partnerships. And so we are committed to making strong complementary partnerships basically our way of working. Um, now 3IE has been associated with uh, Africa Evidence Network since its inception, we're proud to say. Mm -hmm. um, the network was founded uh, in 3IE's Colloquium of Systematic Reviews in, uh, in international development in Dhaka, Bangladesh, um, in December 2012. So 3IE played a role in the birth of this uh, amazing and important network. Um, but you know, at the time, there was no other network explicitly focusing on EIDM, which you've all heard today what it means several times in the intro. And so congratulations to Ruth again for having had the vision to create this and the stamina to to get to where we are today. It's mm -hmm. fantastic. Um, it, 3IE has also partnered earlier on with AFREA. Uh, our inaugural uh, conference had 700 uh, uh, attendees in 20, uh, 2009 in Cairo. Um, and at that time, what I recall, it was that uh, the discussion and the landscape was very different. It was very polarized. Um, there was sort of almost a methods war uh, out there. Uh, and, and a lot of straw men being <laughs> thrown to, uh, uh, out into the discussions. And, and so I would say this has fortunately changed over time. I think the field, we, have grown up a bit. Uh, I love, uh, you know, a lot of what Adeline said, that there's still a lot of way to go, but I think we are much more on a mutual listening mode uh, than, we, than we were at the time. Um, a key topic that we brought to uh, and learned more about in subsequent AEN conferences, we've been to all of them ever since uh, it, the creation of the network, we delved into this issue of uptake and use of research evidence uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, and the importance of networks uh, to, to, and incentives to, to, to really uh, drive this forward. Um, and so 3IE has developed tools, uh, among others, to verify claims about research influence. Um, these are called contribution fusion tracing, uh, and we've started assembling uh, these very verified evidence use stories in the portal. And so I'd like uh, for my colleagues, Durgadas and Tanvi, to stand up uh, just so people who want to know more about the, this can uh, go and talk to them, and they can show you the portal. Thank you. Um, now, one of the lessons we have learned uh, is that decision makers and evaluators do not always know what evidence they need to inform what decisions. Um, and, and, and we can talk about evidence in abstract, but very different types of evidence are needed for different decision points. And so one of the things we have uh, developed recently as you know, come out of these discussions we've had, among others, at, at AN conferences and other places, is a tool, a sort of a menu of services that tells you sort of is focused on questions, and then for this question, here's the kind of method you would need. Mm -hmm. uh, and and, and they, this is the, that would be the source of a of, uh, possible source of evidence. And so uh, this tool, the uh, menu of services, uh, is, is something that, uh, that we think will be uh, useful. And I'd uh, like my colleague Thomas Kelly, who is, could you stand up so people can see you? Um, he joined us recently as a director of evidence to policy and learning. Uh, and he can tell you more about uh, this tool and, and how to find it. I think there's a, there's a QR code somewhere. Uh, 
Um, and then, he's showing something. 3IE is also known, I hope some of you, have, and many of you have heard about our evidence gap maps, which are in 3IE uh, innovation and invention, really. Um, and, uh, and we've led many sessions at the uh, uh, Africa Evidence Network conferences on how to do, make these and use these, what are they good for. And so I'd like to, uh, again, just showing everybody who my team are so that you know who to reach out to, for Birta Snilstrat and uh, Etienne Mwamba to stand up uh, if you want to sort of know more about anything to do with synthesis and evidence gap maps, including our Africa evidence map, please reach out uh, to them. Um, and over time, these EGMs have been uh, a tool that we have sort of both further developed and that had been taken up by many of you uh, probably in this room. Uh, and, and, and we have sort of learned from your, your use and development again of these maps. So it's sort of like an iterative learning that has been going on over the, over the years. And it's fantastic to see how this, is, this tool has, has been taken up. Um, particularly, we worked a lot with, uh, with ACE and, and more recently SACE uh, in close collaboration uh, um, in, in developing uh, evidence gap maps and other rapid synthesis products. Um, and just to mention a few themes that I think are particularly of relevance to the problems of today that, that we have recently developed maps in. There are now um, uh, evidence maps on things like democratic backsliding, democracy, human rights, governance, disinformation. These are the kind of uh, maps where we draw, what do we know from effectiveness and uh, evidence on what works uh, to address these issues and where are the research gaps. Um, through our partnerships with Clear AA, uh, we assisted the Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation of the Government of South Africa with their national evaluation policy and establishing their impact evaluation guidelines. Um, we've also worked in close co a partnership with the West African Development Bank, BOAD, on a variety of initiatives uh, and helping them institutionalize the use of evidence. We also have a West Africa Capacity Building and Impact Evaluation Program, and we have many colleagues that are uh, related to that program here present. It has been supported mainly by the Hewlett Foundation, but also, importantly, by uh, BOAD itself and also the West Africa and Economic and Monetary Union. And it's a regional initiative that promotes the institutionalization of evaluation in national and local level government systems across eight countries in Francophone West Africa. And um, in Boise, how we operate is really that uh, the, it is demand driven by policymakers and their advisors. What kind of questions do they have that are urgent and what can we do to help respond to those quickly, either by rapid ev evidence synthesis uh, or by in evaluations. Um, now we also, in WASI, we've also worked closely with ACED. I believe ACED is also represented here. Uh, and include one of the, some of the things that we've developed in partnership are easy to use guide on using evidence for decision makers at various stages of a project. Um, now, so basically to sum up, 3IE has been able to contribute to and benefit from a much richer and professionalized evaluation and evidence broker network in Africa. Uh, and our new strategy is focused on further deepening uh, our regional focus, um, both in Africa and South Asia, and really doing so with and through partnerships. So looking forward to our further discussions uh, over the next days. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marie. I think you can um, see how um, I demonstrated um, how they invested in relationships at 3IE. So as they celebrate 15 years, you can see there are so many milestones that they are sharing, lessons that they've learned in making sure that they build sustainable relationships to grow the work that they are doing. So I will go over to Ruth to also um, share how she has committed to building our relationships. Maybe before Ruth speaks, and I ask at the back to be prepared to play the video towards um, the end of the session um, so that we're able to um, share that journey as well. 
Thank you very much, Suziwe, and thank you to Marie and the support of 3IE to the network over a very long period of time. Somebody once asked me, how do I think that AN contributes to the ecosystem, the evidence ecosystem in Africa? Uh, what can we do to deepen, institutionalize, and shape the systems for evidence? And I think relationships are at the core of that. And I think it's the relationships, your relationships, your, your ecosystem, and you are part of the ecosystem. We are the evidence ecosystem in Africa. And so we need to think about how we can form meaningful relationships that um, have a long-lasting impact on our continent and the work that we do. And it's, it, it's easy to say, let's be friends, right? And, and um, to build a one-to-one one -one relationship. But it's much harder to think about how to deepen those into team relationships and organizational relationships. And more than that, relationships that will survive, the survive disagreements, conflict, um, and difficulty, and that survive when individuals leave. And um, Rona, I never asked if I could tell the story. I apologize. Can I tell you a story about you and me? Okay. <laughs> Ro Rona and I um, mostly became fr colleagues and friends because at different times one of us was feeling ill. Yeah. <laughs> and so we covered for each other. So I would get a message from Rona saying, I feel really ill, but I can't tell my boss. Cover for me at the dinner, please. And I did many similar things where I would say, Rona, you need to chair this session. I feel really ill. And because we were asking for help and we had things in common that were nothing to do with our work, we built a relationship of trust. Now, we could have left it there and, and been great friends. Our children greet each other online, you know, when they come and wave on the screen, yeah. Um, but that's not going to change the or build the Africa evidence ecosystem. And we have built relationships between our teams mm. and relationships that continue when we're not there <laughs> and relationships that continue across the Africa evidence network and that move from being individual relationships to team relationships and even contractual relationships sometimes and um, relationships that survive without us. So when we think about how the Africa Evidence Network makes an impact across the evidence work that we're doing, I would really um, point to that, that it's, it's about making a friend <laughs> and then it's about taking that friendship to something meaningful and collaborative and productive and building the trust that means that even when you don't agree on something, um, you have the courage to share what's gone wrong. Um, Rona has always laughed at us because those of us in South Africa thought we knew how to do rapid response. And we went to a peer learning workshop with Rona's team. And I, I think you said that like for the first 30 minutes, all we did was tell you what went wrong. <laughs> We tried, well, it went wrong, stuff. this went wrong, this went wrong, this went wrong. <laughs> and you were generous enough to support us in working out how to make sure it didn't go wrong the next time. So these relationships can go back many years. They, they require trust, they require that genuine um, self that you were talking about, not just genuine self of who we are as individuals, but who we are in, in our teams and what's good, what's gone well and what's gone badly and a willingness to share. And I'm very excited that across the Africa Evidence Network, it's not just 5,000 individuals, but it's hundreds of organizations and that we are now moving to a phase where we're beginning to build really strong relationships between our teams and I think that's really exciting for the future. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much, uh, Ruth, for those insights. Um, I think Rona has the yeah. mic. Okay. <laughs> Let's use it. <laughs> no problem. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I, I think when you ask the question, how have our organizations kind of shaped the ecosystem, I was actually thinking, for us, it's the other way around, how the ecosystem has actually shaped us. Because when you look back... Um, we started off with a mission. We knew what we wanted to do. We wanted to provide evidence in a timely manner, you know. Um, 
for, for decisions that were going to come from policymakers. We knew, you know, uh, we, we had a very good model. Um, we knew the capacities that we needed. And then very, very quickly, I remember within, you know, less than a few months, uh, we were request when we presented our first, um, so it started as a pilot. And when we presented our results after six months, uh, you know, there was this uh, immediate interest. Uh, like, okay, how do you do that? You know, because uh, just before we started the work, there was, again, work that had been commissioned by the World Health Organization that actually showed that what we were trying to do doesn't work, you know? And so we, we were only given six months to prove the concept or, you know, we'll just continue with what was already known that it doesn't work. So after six months, we were able to, you know, show something different, and so there was interest. And the very first thing I remember was, will you host a team and show them what you do? That wasn't part of the plan. We, we, we were supposed to do our things, you know, like uh, good researchers, scientists, you sit in your little box, churn out something, send it to where it was supposed to go. Now, this is about bringing us people, uh, what do we do with that? There was no plan for that. But they also didn't speak English, okay? So how is this even supposed to work, okay? But we, you know, we said yes, and we hosted a team from Burkina Faso, Ministry of Health, um, trying to build capacity like on the job. So we are receiving questions from the Ministry of Health in Burkina Faso, they are in French, they tell us what needs to be done, we do it in English, we translate, they send it back, you know, so it went on that way for a while. Very quickly next was Cameroon, Zambia, you know, and we quickly had to rethink, you know, our strategy and what we had planned to do. But this is not on an additional budget. Okay. So you, you, you're kind of reshaping. And again, you, you have the choice of saying, I don't have a budget for it. You know, so we can't do it. Or we don't speak English, so we're not too sure how we're going to take care of these people who are coming. So you have those choices. But very quickly, we also got interest beyond Africa. We were speaking to friends in Latin America, in Eastern Europe, you know, and things were going from one place to another. Um, I could tell a longer story, but I think what I'm coming to is that where we are, we might say we have contributed, and I, I could talk about some of our contributions, but I think the ecosystem has also contributed to our growth. We could have stayed that, you know, uh, model that we had built and said, this is what we want to do, okay? Um, all we do is to provide the evidence. We, we don't do this other stuff. We didn't plan for it. But I think the ecosystem has shaped us to actually realize where the need is. So the need was, yes, with the policymakers, they need evidence. The evidence is not coming through as fast. But we also realize the need for the capacities to do this. And if we choose to run the rest alone, and we have colleagues who would like to do this, but we don't have space for them, we could have stayed you know, that same person or that same group, that same model. And I guess we would still have had work to do. But the ecosystem has shown us what is valuable. And I think looking back now, we appreciate who we are, you know. We've formulated lots of relationships out of stuff like that, lots and lots of relationships, which we have gained from as well. I could walk into Burkina Faso now and my room, I do have a room at the Ministry of Health, you know, um, just out of a relationship like that. Um, I think I could get citizenship very easily in South Africa, yeah? <laughs> Am I stretching it a little too? Yeah? But, but I think there's lots of stuff that we have gained as an organization. Lots of relationships that we are riding on to build our own capacity. Um, and so the ecosystem has shaped us as well. But we have also, um, maybe what we have come with then to the field is a lot of um, lesson sharing uh, and building capacity and, you know, innovating or putting our foot out where everybody thinks, oh, are you sure of what you're doing, you know? We've been brave enough to put our foot out there, not once, not twice, and tested a few things. 
And then these have become a model that people have, um, you know, gone out, modified in their own way, but at least it proves the concept and people are able to go out there and, and, and start on that. Uh, lots of work around rapid evidence synthesis, lots of work around citizen panels, uh, lots of work around pictorial evidence, you know, for, for um, what did you call them? Uh, unempowered populations, okay? So a lot of the evidence synthesis has depended on people being able to read and write. And, you know, there's that gap in what do you do with people who have to make decisions, but they can't read your nice synthesis, they can't read your policy briefs, but they also, you know, are unable to come and interact, you know, in dialogues or, or panels. Um, so testing out with uh, pictorial evidence. And so we have brought that and people have, you know, picked up the model, tested it, come back, critiqued what we have done, but very friendly critiquing that has helped us also build ourselves and done um, um, a really good job. And, you know, the building of capacity, I think we are so proud of that. Um, just being able to host, you know, other evidence brokers. Um, we don't have the answers, they come, we make the mistakes together, we learn together, teams go away, they come back. Uh, there are particular countries that we've hosted more than three times, uh, three different groups, but then they also host us. We go, we do a lesson sharing um, uh, every year, you know, before the pandemic disorganized us, but we're getting back on track. We had this lesson sharing um, with ACE, and you know other stakeholders in South Africa, and it's not that you've come to share answers, but to interrogate you know methods, interrogate how things are done in your context, in their context, and there's a lot that we have learned from that space as well. So I think, much as we might have brought something, we do appreciate how much the ecosystem has formulated and modified what we see today as the Center for Rapid Evidence Synthesis. There's no way we would have been what we are. Um, without, you know, that consideration of what's happening around us. Um, thank you very much, um, Rona. Um, Rosetti? Uh, thank you very much, Rona. You said it's difficult uh, rather to sometimes not every relationship yes. is ours. Yes. We should say no. Sometimes you are in a tight corner and you have nothing to start with but you need work to be done. Mm -hmm. And therefore, sometimes uh, what we do is to make sure that you look for the good in a partner and in a relationship. What is good inside there? Because sometimes we've met instances where when you say no to one relationship, uh, the, the noise goes and ripple. everybody says, she said no, mm -hmm. don't go there. So everybody says no and then you have nobody to work with. So in brand development, sometimes we have to weigh the options, but that was a very good idea. And on this question about what footprint, we are glad as a prayer, and I'm glad this morning, the presentation which was given by Adeline underlined the work that Afrea has been working on around Made in Africa, uh, making sure we remove this Korean, <laughs> that word is so hard, uh, but you know it, you have understood the one we are discussing this morning. <laughs> yes. So uh, we have had a, lo a long history at Afrea since 2007 with the Sule Gal uh, Galiba, uh, may he rest in peace, and many others, uh, Bagele, who have worked so hard uh, on this concept and made sure that we continue making our eyes look in the direction of uh, using indigenous knowledge. Mm -hmm. And we are continuing to ask you to continue doing more research, more work, so that the questions that were posed by Adeline can be answered. We should publish uh, what we have found, because one of the things uh, that we have challenges with is publishing. Many people are doing research and doing uh, kinds of writings but they don't find their way in African journals. For instance, African Evaluation Journal, which is available to all of us. Mm. So we need to publish and say what we have found. The other area where we have worked uh, uh, 
uh, in a, a very special way is incorporating the youth in the agenda of evaluation in Africa through the Young and Emerging Evaluators Network. And uh, they also have uh, about 40 associations working around Africa on different aspects, even including working on the evaluation uh, uh, plans for the future. So we have gone as far as also incorporating uh, two young and emerging evaluators on the AFREA board, one representing the Anglophone and one representing the Francophone. One thing that we all need to work on is that many of us are in the ECD uh, space, but we have uh, worked a lot with the Anglophone side. So every time we look for, for things to do with the Francophone, we can't find it. Even getting a leader uh, who is credible from that side, it's not that they are not there, but we are not caring enough. So going forward, we would like to collaborate and see that more work also goes on the side of the Francophone and bringing Africa together so that we don't do, usually we say, this is a Francophone meeting and this is a Anglophone session. And in that way, we don't bring the views across Africa together. So we need to actually start bringing all these people together and translate, even in terms of writing. Now, uh, I had an opportunity this year to visit uh, Mozambique, uh, the Lusophone, and they were saying, you guys, you don't care about us. It's as if you are in your own world. So we are challenged. They actually are a paid up member of a frere now. And they said, okay, we are going to look for the rest to bring them on board. So as we continue our relationships, we need to reach out. Because some of the uh, lessons we've seen is that as we progress, we start pulling ropes and working in silos and competing instead of being complementary. And that's what uh, the Global North loves, that they find you so weak. When you come to my side, I'm saying something against EN, and EN is saying something against E3IA and all sorts of things. So we need to develop a brand uh, that cannot be torn as we do the relationships. So uh, I would like to also encourage us that we, we speak the same language. We are trying to work on all this. Of course, resources are required uh, to make us work together. Maybe we need uh, a fund which is African to actually progress uh, research, maybe um, um, evaluation on Made in Africa, but one fund which is managed for that purpose so that you don't have to go to Europe because we have recently, we have very many people from the Global North knocking on our doors. Everybody's saying, okay, what are you working on? Made in Africa. I, I want to know that, can I take it away? How can we uh, dissect it? And therefore, we have like five people saying, I have the money, uh, it's here, why don't you take it? So what are we doing in Africa? Why don't we pull resources and choose the agenda we want to work on and we all work in the same direction and also fulfilling the 2063 agenda? Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much to all our speakers. Um, I think we also acknowledge our online uh, audience. Uh, we'll go to them in a, in a bit um, to make sure that we see if there's any inputs or questions from that side. We'll also come to this audience in the room, maybe get two questions, but I think let's do the video because I think it's a, the right time in terms of us, these the three, four organizations sitting here that have more than 10 years experience in building relationships and making a difference in the landscape and in the EIDM to also take time to share um, the journey of the AEM. We know that using the best available evidence to inform decisions can help ensure that those decisions make a difference to the challenges we face. But there are many barriers to using evidence and groups all over the world are trying to address these. At the Africa Evidence Network, we believe that we can only find answers and have an impact by working together. In 2012, 
23 African delegates met at an evidence conference in Bangladesh. They discovered not only their shared sense of isolation in working to support evidence-informed decision-making, but more importantly, their mutual desire to connect with others in this field from their own continent. The network's founding chair, Ruth Stewart, described the energy when these delegates recognized that together, they could achieve more than they ever would achieve alone. Their agreement to share training opportunities and collaborate on funding proposals began before the delegates had even returned home. From the start, the network's impact was achieved through connections. For instance, when the network facilitated mentoring between some researchers and a team at the South African Department for Basic Education, it was such a success that other government departments requested similar mentoring relationships. A monitoring and evaluation team supporting district fisheries in rural Malawi was mentored in how to strengthen their data collection and as a result, the Malawian district team was able to ultimately increase the output of those local fisheries. Another AEN member reported that through being connected to the evidence resources shared by the network, they were able to scale up their school feeding scheme to eventually include all 200 schools in their region. In 2014, the Africa Evidence Network held its first Pan-African Evidence event. Over 100 delegates attended from 10 African countries. That meeting would prove central to ensuring the work that had started in Bangladesh was sustained. Members described how incredible it felt to receive encouragement from others working in this field a mere two years after the AEN had been formally established. From across Africa, stories were shared about how evidence was needed and being used. Government colleagues made it clear that supporting evidence into policy is not an easy task. The relationships are sensitive and need serious investment to build working partnerships that span long-established divides. Still, the work continued and by mid-2015, the AEN had 350 network members and organic engagement on its digital platforms growing every month. And the network started getting noticed by others outside of Africa. You wanted to work in the evidence space in Africa? The AEN became the go-to community and colleagues from around the world, in governments, NGOs and universities started to reach out. Our biennial events became well-established, more innovative and continuously better at showcasing how the African evidence community was pushing the boundaries in this field. By 2016, the network was actively encouraging and promoting evidence-informed decision-making across Africa, contributing to the development of effective public policies and efficient implementation of services. Our focus was on joint learning to support one another to use evidence to tackle poverty and equality. As the network grew, our members began hosting events across several countries, South Africa, Uganda, Kenya, Malawi, Zimbabwe, Ghana, Cameroon, Nigeria, and more. Each event provided a forum where participants could share lessons and advance discussions in supporting evidence use in Africa. The events increased engagement and built trusted relationships with institutions and professionals in the field. These opportunities to connect have led to work that deepens evidence-informed decision-making in Africa, such as the relationship between an evidence team in West Africa and a global evidence funder, and strengthened partnerships amongst East African researchers, government officials, and parliamentary researchers. The power of proximity to begin a relationship had already been demonstrated in the AEN's own origin story. The Secretariat knew how powerful hosting these spaces for relationships to flourish was to advancing the evidence agenda. By 2018, with the support of funding from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, the AEN's evidence gatherings were reaching over 500 individuals across 32 countries through online and in-person engagements. These engagements spanned sectors and enabled evidence producers and users to connect with one another, shifting the boundaries yet again in the evidence landscapes across the region. Recognizing the difficulty of navigating the multiple disciplines, methodologies and sectors of the evidence field, the AEN wanted to support new and emerging leaders, so the Africa Evidence Leadership Award was launched. Winners of the award won the opportunity to showcase their work, 
building their own profiles and promoting the use of evidence. Over the years, winners have reported how receiving the award has helped advance their careers and invigorated them to embark on new ventures to support the use of evidence in their countries. In the network's routine collection of stories of change about how evidence makes a difference across Africa and how the AEN makes a difference to those working in the evidence space, it is not uncommon to discover examples of how these relationships have flourished. For instance, the story of Effective Basic Services Africa. This Cameroonian NGO that works to make basic services more effective by applying the available research to service delivery received an international award for their work supporting evidence use during the COVID-19 pandemic after a nomination from an AEN member. Luvuyo Jalisa, one of our emerging evidence leaders, was recently named one of the top 200 young South Africans. The way AEN members support and strengthen one another extends far beyond meeting at a conference. In 2019, a new idea to connect members emerged. The premise was the same, share members' work and make connections, although the space was a little different. All members met virtually for what became Africa Evidence Week. This virtual event, hosted on social media, showcased and promoted the use of evidence. Members volunteered and shared their experiences, challenges and successes. Each week sees close to 1,000 people engaging in over 100 dedicated activities from organizations and individuals that span the continent. When the storm that was 2020 and the COVID-19 pandemic hit the world, the AEN became a conduit through which members provided evidence in response to numerous requests from policymakers and public service organizations. And that year, our evidence event went fully online with over 600 people from 44 countries joining a fully interactive and learning experience. The AEN's virtual work had deepened since then, with online communities of practice formed and facilitated to collectively advance solutions for challenging issues. Out of such a community of practice, the network's manifesto for capacity development for evidence-informed decision-making in Africa was born. As the network, its membership and its impacts have all grown, so its influence has extended beyond Africa. The network proudly mentored and supported emerging evidence coalitions in Latin America in 2021 and 2022. The AEN's work shows no sign of slowing. In 2023, the network launched an evidence podcast where new topics are explored with a range of contributors. And the newly launched Africa Evidence Youth League is stimulating, innovating and breaking new ground. New communities of practice are formed as members gather online to explore solutions to how to meaningfully expand the ways in which evidence is valued, to embrace forms of knowledge often overlooked, and to ensure localization of evidence use is meaningful and long-lasting. 2022 marked a decade since the 23 delegates from Africa met at that evidence conference in Bangladesh. Those first members could never have known that their meeting would result in a network of nearly 5,000 people. As evidence-informed policy in Africa continues to thrive, so too does this network where you can connect with others also looking to make a difference. Although we do not know what the future will bring, we do know that only together will evidence-informed decision-making become a reality. Um, thank you very much. I, thank you very much. I see there's beeping, beeping. That our time is up a bit. Um, I want to say I think the the video sort of brings together the conversation that we've just had. Um, the video is available on the AEN YouTube website, so you can go look at it at your own time as well. So I think just to wrap up the session, um, Hazel, is there any questions online or comments?
Thank you, Siziwe, and thank you to this interesting panel. I'm here to present the evidence of an engaged online audience through lovely <laughs> comments and interesting questions that have been posted on the chat. So the first question is from Carolyn. What are your thoughts around legislating evidence for policy as they do in the US, compelling policymakers to use evidence? And how do you ensure the quality of evidence in a world where interests seep in? That's the first question. Um, the second one is, uh, I think it's posed to Rossetti. Are there journals specialized in publishing articles on evidence based in Africa, as most international journals are costly or expensive. And then the last one is a comment from Kululeko. Thank you for extremely beautiful journeys. In your experience, how do we sustain relationships between organizations when leadership visions and approaches change over time? If in the worst case, we stand at cross purposes. Should we always strive to realign? Thank you. Thank you very much to the online uh, audience. Um, I don't know who's going to take the first one because the second one is specific to someone in particular. Then the third one, um, someone must pick it as well, just to make sure that we, we share some insights um, in the shorter period that we are having remaining. Yes. I know we're out of time, so I'm going to give you a quick answer. I don't think it's worked very well in the United States, so I don't think we should copy it. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, I work in the in, in, in public sector, and uh, compelling policymakers does not work very well. Uh, they choose. The, the evidence varies across spectrum, and they will choose what they want to use and from where. And most cases, they will choose what has been researched in public sector itself, not from everywhere. Now, uh, the, uh, the publishing, uh, we have the African Evaluation Journal, which has been around for as many years as almost uh, 20. And uh, uh, there are if, uh, costs, but they are not very high because we subsidize them. And uh, we, we, we put in something at the publisher and say, if someone is coming, for instance, from a French-speaking country, we want to, 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 to subsidize 100%, and then maybe a little bit less for English-speaking, and then again subsidize for young and emerging evaluators because we want to bring them on board. So yes, there's a, 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 an opportunity and, and we have an editorial team led by Mark. We can give more details as we go along. But I want to appreciate also the presidents that have led AFREA. Uh, I, search, I see Serge there. Uh, I don't know if there's any other AFREA president, Adeline, and then myself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosetti. The third one, who would like to tackle it for us? Can I? Come, go on the first one as well. Yeah. First of all, just, just briefly, to say, because I disagree slightly. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, uh, some of this will be the discussion uh, in the session later today around, you know, institutionalizing evidence use, so a little uh, heads up to that. And, and I would just say, I, th I think definitely alone, it's not going to work. Uh, there are organizations have tried le legislating, and it can easily become a box-ticking exercise, as, as I think. But if you can do that together with other things, uh, together with training, together with the, the right incentives, etc., I think that that that, that is uh, that is something worth looking at. And so, you know, some some amount of evidence that that may be working. But as I said, alone not. And then just a plea relating to uh, legislation and politics. You know how decision makers, and especially politicians, are, are very different from evaluators. They, they basically have to take a stand. They see one side, and you all see all the sides, right? So, so evaluators are very sort of um, different from the typical decision makers. And I would plead that more of you basically at some point get off the fence and maybe sort of join in politics because of your critical mindsets. I think that is exactly what is also needed in, uh, in policymaking, in decision making. 
Um, and so I'll stop with that. Uh, thank you. I think you said it very well. On the first question, I wanted to, to really say that you can't think about legislation on its own. Uh, what is supporting um, uh, or what are the other interventions in place? So to get the policy makers to do, you know, or to use evidence, one, they need capacity. And I think many of them don't really have the optimal capacity, you know, to, to be able to use the evidence as, you know, the, the way we think they should be doing it or the way we think is optimal. And that, you know, I'm hesitant because it's also problematic. You know, it, it puts the focus on us, but they too, you know, uh, have reasons for what they do. And so um, one is being able to build that capacity for them to see beyond, say, the evidence coming from the public service. That is what they know, okay? How do you get them then to give uh, um, an eye to anything else? So, so there is that part that we kind of expect them to do stuff which they might not be capacitated for. But also there's need for incentives. And, and I don't say incentives the way we generally think about them in terms of, oh, is there a reward for them to do it? But there also need to be system incentives that sometimes it's actually difficult to, to get to the evidence or to use it or to make sense of it. And so the system needs to have incentives that, that put a policymaker in a place where you know, it's easier for them to use the evidence than to use their gut feeling. And many of the times, you know, you're going to put legislation in place and these incentives are not there and it will still fall flat on its face. Um, how to sustain relationships, you know, in changing organizations, changing, um, um, you know, settings, changing contexts. I think relationships will naturally, some of them will naturally die off, okay? And others will begin to build and there will be those that are here to last forever, okay? So I think, uh, you know, when you take that time that we talked about, that you step back and always analyze and, and uh, stay in touch with yourself and, you know, what's happening around the ecosystem, you will know which or what is happening uh, with which relationship and you won't really struggle. But that's not to say that, uh, you know, it all works out. All relationships are hard work. There is work to be put in. So don't get into a relationship, whether it's personal or, uh, you know, for the organization and think, okay, eh, we signed that MOU, now we're good. Okay, there'll be work to do. All uh, relationships need nurturing, but that's like, yeah, a story for another day. Thank you very much. Um, um, we've run out of time, really. I think the people that are in person, you have access to these amazing women. So please engage with them and make sure that if you have any question, get them to answer uh, those questions for you. And I think I would like to thank them very much for participating in this panel. And also I would like to encourage women that are attending this event and particularly um, the young and emerging leaders that are joining us uh, as well to take time to step up, you know, um, make a difference uh, in terms of the work that we do. And I also want to connect this session. This is women that are experienced the session 22 on the last day, the session of young and emerging leaders that are going to say, what does the future look like as driven by us young and emerging leaders? So please join that session to connect and see how they hand over the baton to them. It is time, right? Yes. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining the session. <laughs>